good day, dear viewers. Let me introduce myself. I'm Abigail Adams, and my good husband, John, here, you most likely already know through his long career in service at the United States of America. As a great mind, a diplomat, and a politician, and a president. Our marriage has been one of deep love and commitment, but also one of separations as a consequence of duties to our country. Perhaps you too have experienced the painful absence of a friend long separated due to consequences beyond your control. John and I have found ease to our loneliness by writing letters to each other over the years. To sit and contemplate the deepest matters of the heart and mind with pen in hand allowed us to maintain a strong connection even when the other was so far away. We had to begin this practice early as when we were new newlyweds, John had to ride all over Massachusetts to earn a living practicing law. On September 14, 1767, my dearest friend, I know from the tender affection you bear me and our little ones that you will rejoice to hear that we are well. Our son is much better than when you left home and our daughter rocks him to sleep with a song of come Papa, come home to brother Johnny. Sunday seems a more lonesome day to me than any other when you are absent. For though I may be compared to those climates which are deprived of the sun half the year, yet upon a Sunday you commonly afforded us with your benign influence. I am now at Weymouth. My father brought me here last night. And tomorrow I return home, where I hope soon to receive the dearest of friends and the tenderest of husbands. With the unabated affection which has for years passed and will, whilst the vital spark lasts, burn in the bosom of your affectionate A. Adams. Traveling for weeks on end in order to make a living and provide for my growing family was an agony for me. When I am too long away from my wife and my farm, I tend to grow bitter and ill-tempered. In May of 1772, while in Plymouth, I wrote, I wish myself at Braintree. This wandering, itinerating life grows more and more disagreeable to me. I want to see my wife and children every day. I want to see my grass and blossoms and corn every day. But above all, except the wife and children, I want to see my books. None of these amusements are to be had. The company we have is not agreeable to me. In Colonel Warren and his lady, I find friends. Mr. Angier is very good, but farther than these, I have very little pleasure in conversation. Don't expect me before Saturday, John Adams. One winter, just after the destruction of the tea in Boston, I was trapped at the house of my parents, prolonging what had only been intended to be a brief visit, and stranding Mr. Adams at home with four little ones to mind. December 30th, 1773. Alas, how many snowbanks divide thee and me, and my warmest wishes to see thee will not melt one of them. I have not heard one word from thee or the little one since I left home. I did not take any cold coming down, and I find myself in better health than I was. I wish to hear the same account from you. The time I propose to tarry has elapsed. I shall soon be homesick. The roads are at present impassable with any carriage. I shall not know how to content myself longer than the beginning of next week. I never left a flock so large of little ones before. You must write me how they all do. My daily thoughts and nightly slumbers visit thee and thine. I feel gratified with a thoughtful imagination at the close of day in seeing the little flock round you inquiring when mama will come home, as they often do for thee in thy absence. You will not fail in remembering me to our little ones and telling Johnny that his grandmama has sent him a pair of mittens. 
and Charlie that I shall bring his when I come home. Our little Tommy, you must kiss for Mama and bid Nabby write to me. Don't disappoint me and let John return without a few lines to comfort the heart of your affectionate Abigail Adams. In the summer of 1774, my law practice brought me to a particularly tedious session far north of Boston. This work was truly wearing on me and I felt my time was being wasted while revolution was spreading through the colonies. This is the second day of the term at York. Very little business, very hot weather. My refreshment is a flight to Braintree to my cornfields and grass plots, my gardens and meadows. My fancy runs about you perpetually. It is continually, continually with you and in the neighborhood of you frequently takes a walk with you and your little prattling Nabby, Johnny, Charlie, and Tommy. We walk all together up Penn's Hill, over the bridge to the plain, down to the garden, etc. I regret that I cannot have the pleasure of enjoying this fine weather with my family upon my farm. Oh, how often I am there. I have but a dull prospect before me. I have no hope of reaching Braintree under a fortnight from this day if I should in 20 days. I regret my absence from the county of Suffolk this week on another account. If I were there, I could converse with the gentlemen who are bound with me for Philadelphia. I could turn the course of my reading and studies to such subjects of law and politics and commerce as may come and play at the Congress. I might be furbishing up my old reading in law and history that I might appear with less indecency before a variety of gentlemen whose educations, travel, experience, family, fortune, and everything will give them a vast superiority to me and I fear to my companions. I sometimes think I must come to this, to be the foreman upon my own farm and the schoolmaster to my own children. I shall arouse myself ere long, I believe, and exert an industry a frugality, a hard labor that will serve my family if I can't serve my country. I will not lie down and die in despair. If I cannot serve my children by the law, I will serve them by agriculture, by trade, by some way or other. I thank God I have a head, a heart and hands, which have once fully exerted altogether will succeed in the world. At fall with Mr. Adams away in Philadelphia, representing Massachusetts at the Continental Congress, I relied on our correspondence more than ever to keep my spirits up. Well, only this time, we had no idea how long it will be until we could return home. September 16, 1774 from Braintree. I dined today at Colonel Quincy's. Upon my return at night, Mr. Thaxter met me at the door with your letter dated from Princeton, New Jersey. It really gave me such a flow of spirits that I was not composed enough to sleep till one o'clock. <laughs> I am rejoiced to hear you are well. I want to know many more particulars than you wrote to me, and I hope soon to hear from you again. I dare not trust myself with the thought of how long you may perhaps be absent. I only count the weeks already passed and they amount to five. Boston Harbor had been closed and the city besieged since June of 1774, crippling the entire colony of Massachusetts. The Congress in Philadelphia was the first of its kind, a gathering of Americans from throughout the colonies offering their support and unity during the great and important work to come. September 18th, 1774. The esteem, the affection, the admiration for the people of Boston and Massachusetts, which, are, which were expressed yesterday, and the fixed determination that they should be supported were enough to melt a heart of stone. I saw the tears gush into the eyes of the old 
grave, pacific Quakers of Pennsylvania. You cannot conceive, my dear, the hairy of business, visits, and ceremonies which we are obliged to go through. We have a delicate course to steer between too much activity and too much insensibility in our critical interested situation. I flatter myself, however, that we shall conduct our embassy in such a manner as to merit the approbation of our country. Boston and the surrounding towns were truly suffering by the summer of 1775, with hunger and disease spreading from the town out into the countryside, where crops may gave way to battlefields. I worried constantly about my family and friends, but none so very much as my dear absent partner. From Weymouth, June 16, 1775. I feared much for your health when you went away. I must entreat you to be as careful as you can, consistent with the duty you owe your country. That consideration alone prevailed with me to consent to your departure. In a time so perilous and so hazardous to your family, and with a body so infirm as to require the tenderest care in nursing. I wish you may be supported and divinely assisted in this most important crisis, when the fate of empires depend upon your wisdom and conduct. While the Congress in Philadelphia debated monumental action, such as the support of a continental army and declaring independence from Great Britain, my heart was breaking to be so distant from my family during a time of grave illness and loss. October 19th, 1775. Really, it is very painful to be 400 miles from one's family and friends when we know they are in affliction. It seems as if it would be a joy to me to fly home, even to share with you your burdens and misfortunes. Surely, if I were with you, it would be my study to allay your griefs, to mitigate your pains, and to divert your melancholy thoughts. When I shall come home, I know not. We have so much to do, and it is so difficult to do it right that we must learn patience. Upon my word, I think, if ever I were to come here again, I must bring you with me. I could live here pleasantly if I had you with me. Will you come? and have the smallpox here. I wish I could remove all the family, our little daughter and sons, and all go through the distemper here. What if we should? Let me please myself with a thought, however. From Braintree, November 5th, 1775. I mean to thank you for all your obliging favors lately received. And though some of them are very laconic, Yet they were they to contain only two lines to tell me that you were well, they would be acceptable to me. I hope, however, that it will not be long before we shall have nearer interviews. You must tell me you will return next month. A late appointment will make it inconvenient, provided you accept for you to go again to Congress. The little flock in receiving Papa's letters have been more gratified than they could have been by any other present. <laughs> they are very proud of being thus noticed. Master John <coughs> has been very anxious to write, but has been confined for several days with a severe cold, which has given him sore eyes. But he begs me to make his excuse and say that he has wrote twice before, but it did not please him well enough to send it. <laughs> Mabby has been with her Auntie Betsy ever since her grandmama's death. Charlie and Tommy beg Mama to thank Papa for their letters and wish they could write to tell him so. Brother and Sister Cranch send their love. Your mother speaks pathetically of you and always sends her love to you. I will only ask you to measure by your own the affectionate regard of your nearest friend. push for independence was a long and exhausting campaign, but I found solace in the knowledge that my sacrifices might make the world better for my children. 
In Mrs. Adams, I had a like-minded partner and a collaborator dedicated to the education and success of the young generations. April 15th, 1776, Philadelphia. What will come of this labor, time will discover. I shall get nothing by it, I believe, because I never get anything by anything that I do. I am sure the public or posterity ought to get something. I believe my children will think I might as well have thought and labored a little night and day for their benefit, but I will not bear the reproaches of my children. I will tell them that I studied and labored to procure a free constitution of government for them to solace themselves under. And if they do not prefer this to ample fortune, to ease and elegance, they are not my children and I care not what becomes of them. They shall live upon thin diet, wear mean clothes and work hard with cheerful hearts and free spirits or they may be the children of the earth or of no one. John has genius, so has Charles. Take care that they don't go astray. Nabby and Tommy are not forgotten by me, although I did not mention them before. The first by reason of her sex requires a different education from the two I have mentioned. Of this, you are the only judge. I want to send each of my little pretty flock some present or other. I have walked over this city 20 times and gaped at every shop like a countryman to find something, but could not. Ask every one of them what they would choose to have and write it to me in your next letter. From this, I shall judge of their taste and fancy and discretion. August 14, 1776. <clears throat> If you complain of neglect of education in sons, what shall I say with regard to daughters who every day experience the want of it? With regard to the education of my own children, I find myself soon out of my debt and destitute and deficient in every part of education. I most sincerely wish that some more liberal plan might be laid and executed for the benefit of the rising generation. <laughs> and that our new constitution may be distinguished for learning and virtue. If we mean to have heroes, statesmen and philosophers, we should have learned women. The world perhaps would laugh at me and accuse me of vanity, but you, I know, have a mind too enlarged and liberal to disregard the sentiment. If much depends, as is allowed, upon the early education of youth, and the first principles which are instilled take the deepest root, great benefit must arrive from literary accomplishment in women. <sighs> Excuse me, my pen has run away with me. I have no thoughts of coming to Philadelphia. The length of time I have and shall be detained here would have prevented me, even if you had no thoughts of returning until December. But, I live in daily expectation of seeing you here. Brief visits to Braintree in the winters were never enough to satisfy my desire to be at home and with my family. I was endlessly homesick for the company of my lifelong friends, my mother, my in-laws, and above all, my good wife. February 10th, 1777. It is now a month and a few days since I left you. I have heard nothing from you, nor received a letter from Massachusetts. I hope the post office will perform better than it has done. I am anxious to hear how you do. I have in my mind a source of anxiety, which I never had before, since I became such a wanderer. Tell me you are as well as can be expected. My duty to your papa and my mama Love to brothers and sisters. Tell Betsy, I hope she is married, though I, I want to throw the stocking. My respects to Mr. Shaw. Tell him he may be a Calvinist if he will, provided always that he preserves his candor, charity, and moderation. What shall I say of or to 
my nabby, John, Charles, and Thomas. What will they say to me for leaving them, their education and fortune, so much to the disposal of chance? May Almighty and all gracious providence protect and bless them. By the spring of 1777, we had been at war for two years, and Mr. Adams had once again uh, answered his duty by returning to the Congress uh, to serve, uh, serve in the Congress of the newly independent United States of America. I was at the time expecting our sixth child, and I would have much preferred to have him to myself. But I understood the sacrifices required of everyone in the great cause. March 9th, 1777 from Braintree. I have this day received a most agreeable packet for which I return you the most hearty thanks and which contains much amusement and gave me pleasure. <laughs> Though I cannot help wishing you nearer. You make some inquir inquiries which tenderly affect me. I think upon the whole, I have enjoyed as much health as I ever did in like situation. The situation I do not repine at. It is a constant remembrancer of an absent friend and excites sensations of tenderness, which are much, much better felt than expressed. Our little ones are well and often talk and wish for you. Master Tommy desires I would write a letter for him, which I promised to do. Your mama tenderly inquires after you. I cannot do your message to Betsy, since the mortification I endure at the mention of it is so great that I have never changed a word with her upon the subject, although preparations are making for housekeeping. Heaven preserve and return in safety the dearest friend to his Portia. May 15th. 1777. General Warren writes me that my farm never looked better than when he last saw it, and that Mrs. Adams was like to outshine all the farmers. I wish I could see it, but I can make allowances. He knows the weakness of his friend's heart, that nothing flatters it more than praises bestowed upon a certain lady. I am suffering every day for want of my farm to ramble in. I have been now for near 10 weeks in a drooping, disagreeable way, loaded constantly with a cold. In the midst of infinite noise, hurry, and bustle, I lead a lonely, melancholy life, mourning the loss of all the charms of life, which are my family and all the amusement that I ever had in life, which is my farm. I expect that I shall be chained to this oar until my constitution both of mind and body are totally destroyed and rendered wholly useless to myself and family for the remainder of my days. However, I will neither whine nor croak the moment our affairs are in a prosperous way and a little more out of doubt. That moment I become a private gentleman, the respectful husband of the amiable Mrs. Adams of Braintree in the affectionate father of her children, which I have scarcely supported for these three years past. Mr. Adams was appointed to several diplomatic missions to Europe over the next decade. First, to secure an alliance with France and financial support from the Netherlands. Uh, then to negotiate the Treaty of Paris, which finally ended the war and ultimately as an ambassador to uh, London. In spite of our best efforts to maintain our correspondence, letters took months to reach each other and were often lost at sea. On Christmas day, 1780, I wrote to John, who at the time was in Amsterdam with our two oldest sons. My dearest friend, how much is comprised in that one short sentence? How fondly can I call you mine, bound by every tie which consecrates the most inviolable friendship, yet separated by a cruel destiny. I feel the pangs of absence sometimes too sensibly for my own repose. It is then that I feel myself alone in the wide world, 
without anyone to tenderly care for me or lend me an assisting hand through the difficulties that surround me. I find in my own breast a sympathetic power always operating upon the near approach of letters from my dear absent friend. I cannot determine the exact distance when this secret charm begins to operate. The time is sometimes longer and sometimes shorter. The busy silks ever at my ear. No sooner does Morpheus close my eyes than my whole, my whole soul, unbounded, flies to thee. Am I superstitious enough for a good Catholic? <laughs> A vessel arrived from Holland and brought me your letters from Amsterdam, 25th September. I have written to you largely since Davis was here, though not in reply to the letters you brought by him, for old Neptune alone had the handling of them. He was chased by a British ship and foolishly threw over all his letters into the sea, to my no small mortification. Our friends are well. So is your ever affectionate Portia. Love to my dear John and Charles. I mourn the loss of their mothers. By the fall of 1783, the war for independence had finally concluded with the Treaty of Paris. With our ships no longer at war on the Atlantic, I was desperate to see my wife, despite being detained in Europe on further business for the new nation. September 7th, 1783, Paris. I cannot justify going home. But what shall I do for want of my family? By what I hear, I think Congress will give us all leave to come home in the spring. Will you come to me this fall and go, come home with me in the spring? If you will, come with my dear Nabby, leaving the two boys at Mr. Shaw's, in the house in place under the care of your father, Uncle Quincy, or Dr. Tufts, or Mr. Cranch. This letter may reach you by the middle of October, and in November, you may embark for London, Amsterdam, or any port of France. On your arrival, you will find friends enough. The moment I hear of it, I will fly with post horses to receive you at least, and if the balloon, should be carried to such perfection in the meantime as to give mankind the safe navigation of the air, I will fly in one of them at the rate of 30 knots an hour. This is my sincere wish. Although the expense will be considerable, the trouble to you great, and you will probably have to return with me in the spring. I am so unhappy without you that I wish you would come at all events. I wasn't able to fly to my husband with quite the speed he would have wanted. But by the following spring, I had put affairs in order at home and was ready to undertake the daunting voyage and reunite with my good man. May 25, 1784, Boston, bound for Europe. I came to town yesterday and have engaged my passage aboard the ship active. And now, my dear friend, let me request that you go to London sometime in July, that if it please God to conduct me thither in safety, I may have the happiness to meet you there. I am embarking on board a vessel without any male friend, connection or acquaintance, my servant accepted. A stranger to the captain and every person on board, situation which I once thought nothing would tempt me to undertake. But let no person say what they would or would not do, since we are not judges for ourselves until circumstances call us to act. It is six months since a single line reached me from you. All communication seems to be shut out between Amsterdam and America. We returned home from Europe in 1788 to an infant nation with a new constitution and federal government and it soon came to be that I was called to Philadelphia once more to serve as vice president for George Washington. Mrs. Adams came with me for a while, but was often ill and ultimately returned home to preserve her health and manage our properties in Braintree, or Quincy as it has now been renamed. 
After so many years of hardship, this separation was the most tiring. I tried to make brief visits home when I was not bound by my obligations to the Senate. February 27th, 1793, Philadelphia. My dearest friend, I am so anxious for your health that I shall take the stage on Monday for New York, but whether I shall go by the packet to Providence or continue in the stage to Boston, I know not. This will depend upon the wind and other circumstances to be learned at New York. The fermentation in Europe distresses me, lest it should take a turn which may involve us in many difficulties. Our neutrality will be a very delicate thing to maintain, and I am not without apprehensions that Congress, or at least the Senate, may be called together in the summer, if not earlier. However, we must be prepared as well as we can for events. I am weary of reading newspapers. The times are so full of events, the whole drama of the world is such a tragedy that I am weary of the spectacle. Oh, my sweet little farm, what would I not give to enjoy thee without interruptions? But I see no end to my servitude. However, the nations of Europe and even of Africa may recover their liberty. John's two terms as vice president were difficult for both of us. After three decades of service and sacrifice to our country, we were both eager to retire together and live our remaining years in tranquility. And so, when President Washington expressed no desire to serve a third term and the eye of succession, not to imply any sort of monarchical thinking, fell to John, I felt myself quite cheated over my lot in life. Still, yielding to civic duty and responsibility is a skill we have both honed over this long career. January 21st, 1796. Some communications in your letters are a source of much anxiety to me. <clears throat> my ambition leads me not to be first in Rome. And the event you request me to contemplate is so serious of a nature that it requires much reflection and deliberation to determine upon it. There is not a beam of light, <laughs> nor a shadow of comfort or pleasure in the contemplation of the object. If personal considerations alone were to weigh, I should say immediately retire with the principle. I can only say, that circumstances must govern you. In a matter of such momentous concern, I dare not influence you. <clears throat> I must pray that you have superior direction. As to the holding of the office of vice president, there I will give my opinion. Resign, retire. I won't be second under no man but Washington. Upon my pillow, I shall reflect, fear and tremble and pray that the President of the United States may long, long continue to hold the reins of government and that his valuable life may be prolonged for that purpose. My term as President of the United States, while carried out with honor, devotion, and the best of intentions for my country was ultimately not my crowning achievement in life. I far prefer the legacy I left in the Massachusetts Constitution. I succeeded in keeping America out of another war with Europe, but my heart was, as always, with my home and my family. Retirement, along with the final lasting reunion with my dearest friend, and thus the end of our necessity to write these letters, was a reward I anticipated above all. December 25th, 1798. Philadelphia. Your solicitude for my health may subside. I am pretty well. I had a cold, not a bad one, but it is gone. I am old, old, very old, and never shall be very well. Certainly while in this office, for the drudgery of it is too much for my years and strength. The barn must not be a monument of foppery. I protest against all expensive ornament. 
My fortune is small, family large, and expensive, and shiftless children and grandchildren enough to distract me. A fine barn coupled with my hut would be a womanly head on a fish's shoulders. Let me spin an even thread of plainness through life. It is Christmas and a fine day. I rode yesterday, 14 miles and intended as much today. Our family is very quiet, no quarrels, no complaints. 120 leagues in this cold season would be a terrible risk for you and only to be here three months and then a worse journey home. My health would be no better for your being a witness of any pains or aches I might have. I sleep well, appetite is good, work hard, conscious is neat and e easy, content to live and willing to die, so I sincerely think. Hoping to do a little good, able to do very little, perplexed and embarrassed very often by the folly of some, the intrigue of others, and the selfishness and ambition of many. I am as ever, J.A. Hello everyone. My name is Esther Cohn and I'm an education specialist at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. I'm here to guide you through an important civic action that you can take to make your voice heard. Writing a letter to the President of the United States. Before I give you some tips for writing your own letter, I'm going to provide some background information and share a few letters that young people wrote to President Kennedy. With email, texting, and social media, it's quite possible that you've never written a letter to anyone, never mind the President of the United States. But letter writing used to be the main form of written communication. Letters have been sent to and from presidents since George Washington, the first US president. And President Kennedy received many, many letters from famous people like Eleanor Roosevelt, Jackie Robinson, and Helen Keller, but also from everyday people like you and me. All right, guess how many letters we have in our archives or our collections from everyday people? Do you think it's 100, 1,000, 100,000 more? I was shocked to learn that we have about 2.8 million letters from everyday people. That is a lot of mail. If a family member or someone you know wrote a letter to President Kennedy, we might have it in our collections. Now these letters are part of the historical record. They're primary sources that provide evidence about what people were thinking and feeling at the time and what actions they hoped President Kennedy would take to address their concerns. Many young people wrote letters to the president and I'd like to share some of them with you. They might give you some ideas about how to write your own letter. You'll notice that they are handwritten and two of them are in cursive. Now trying to read or decipher letters from the past is a good challenge, but we wanna make sure you can read the message. So we'll provide a transcription to make it a little easier. Here's the first letter. It's from David Dwight Roskam. Let's see what he, request he had for the president. Dear President Kennedy, I am five years old and I live to watch television. Hmm, do you think he meant love? All right, back to the letter. I know you have to be on television because it is important. Please try to be on at a time when my favorite shows are over. If you need help, ask Caroline. Thank you, David Dwight Roskam. 1371 Panther Road. It looks like Ripple, Pennsylvania, PA, but I think it's Royal, Pennsylvania. 
David made an important request that President Kennedy not take over his TV time. In case you didn't know, Caroline refers to President and Mrs. Kennedy's daughter, who would have been about three or four years old at the time. All right, now for our second letter, a letter of advice. Let's see what advice Joan Grant had for President Kennedy about rockets. At the time, the US was competing with the Soviet Union, of which Russia was a part. Both the US and the Soviet Union we're trying to develop the best space program in the world. I love this letter because it shows that young people were aware of the race for space. Notice Joan's address at the top. She's from Santa Barbara in California. And see the word to the left of the address? She must have meant for this to be top secret information. Let's see what Joan had to say. Dear President Kennedy, I think you are a very nice president, but I think you should use more oil and gas in your rockets and airplanes. You should try it. Make a smaller rocket ship and put more oil and gas in it. Because the Russians have an airplane that can go 90 days without stopping. Maybe if you used a person who is light and can fit in a small airplane or rocket, it might do the same things as the Russians plane did. Now, did you notice the date of this letter? There it is, May 2nd, 1961. I was fascinated to see this date. It was about two and a half weeks after Yuri Gagarin launched into space, making the USSR the first country to launch a person in space. But the US wasn't far behind. Alan Shepard blasted off in the Freedom 7 space capsule on May 5th, 1961, three days after the date of the letter. Like Joan, you can send a letter of advice to the president. I'd like to show you one more letter before you get ready to write your own. Can you find the date on this letter? Yes, September 17th. 1963. This letter is part of a packet that was sent to President Kennedy from a class of eighth grade students in New York City. They were writing in response to a tragic event that took place on September 15, 1963, just about two and a half weeks after the March on Washington. Members of the Ku Klux Klan planted a bomb in the 16th Street Baptist Church, a black congregation in Birmingham, Alabama. The explosion killed four young girls. Let's read James Jones's letter of concern and his suggestion for President Kennedy to address the violence in Birmingham, Alabama. Sir, I am very concerned about the situation in Alabama it makes my heart ache to see civilized people do such violence. The bombing on Sunday was really awful. Those children were innocent. I know you are the president and you try to do things well, but I would like to offer a small suggestion. I know you have some troops stationed there, but why not send more and make sure they are stern enough to enforce the law and to see that the local police does likewise. Respectfully yours, James Jones. So now that you've seen three letters written to President Kennedy, I think you're ready to write one of your own. We have two templates you can use to write your own letter. The templates guide you to include important information in the letter, like your address, the greeting, the name of the person you're writing to, and a polite closing. That part is pretty straightforward, but now comes the harder part, the moment of truth, what to write about. Take your time thinking about this. Some of you might know right away what you would like to say to the president. Others of you might have a blank whiteboard in your head or even feel frozen. No worries, relax 
let yourself brainstorm, which means come up with a bunch of ideas. But how to decide what to write about. This is when you get to share your point of view on an issue that's important to you. You can start right in your own neighborhood or open up your view and go national. You can use your personal experience. What is an issue that has affected you, your family, or people you know? What have you been following in the news or learned about in school? Sometimes it helps to talk it through with a family member or friend to focus your thoughts or get new ideas. In fact, you can actually write the letter with someone else. We have many letters from young people in our collection who wrote as a group. You can use these questions to help you. What is one major concern that you have for your community, state, or country? Why is it important? What can people do to help? What can the president do? After you generate some possible answers to these questions, you're ready to use one of the templates to write a draft. You can write directly on the template or just use it as a guide. To make it more personal, use the completed template as a draft and write your final draft on a separate sheet of paper. Be sure to sign your name and include your address so that the president or the White House staff can send you a response. The White House website asks that letters be written in ink. The templates we're providing are to the president, but you can write to the vice president if you prefer. Now it's time to address the envelope. You send it to the White House, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, Northwest, Washington, DC, 20500. Be sure to put your address in the upper left-hand corner. Don't forget to put a stamp on it. Otherwise, the letter will be returned to you. And I think it's just the right time to give a shout out to the US Postal Service who will deliver your letter anywhere in the US for just one stamp. It costs less than $1 to send a letter from anywhere in the United States to the White House. If you don't have stamps at home, you can buy them at the post office and also at banks, some convenience stores, pharmacies, ATM machines, some gas stations, and online. Finally, put your letter in a mailbox and be patient. It may take a long time to hear back. And will you actually hear back? Let me just tell you that this is an activity we do at President's Day Festival each year, and we've heard from participants that they have received a response. Although this activity focuses on sending a letter through the mail, you can also email the president, which is explained on one of our handouts on our website. By the way, if you feel stuck at any point, you can come back to this video to rewatch or pause or rewind. I'm here for you. You know, you don't have to limit your letter writing to the president or elected officials. It's a real lift to receive a personal letter. I feel so lucky that my father is an avid letter, letter writer. For my entire adult life, he has sent me at least one letter or postcard every week. And even though now he lives only 15 minutes away, look at what I get in the mail. So consider writing to someone you know who lives far away or close by. It's a great way to connect. I wish I could see your letter. I love to hear what young people are thinking about. But this one is between you and the president. Thank you for listening. Now it's time to make your voice heard. Thank you.